Good morning. morning. Welcome to Lock Raven Presbyterian Church. Um, Just wanted to read a verse here from scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that's what we're here to do today. We're here to rejoice, to pray, and give thanks. And therefore, we're being obedient to God's will as we worship him together. If you are a visitor here for the first time, we especially welcome you. And we have a visitor bag, um, gift bag, if you'd like to pick one up in the lobby. Uh, There's some information about the church in there and um, a couple of little gifts. Uh, The first announcement I have (coughs) has to do with the ACTC Thanksgiving uh, food drive. They are having that this year, and it's basically the same process as it had been, has been in, in other years. There are some um, sheets out in the narthex that look like this that have the items to, to get. Um, and I will preface these couple of announcements with um, this information has been sent out in the newsletter and in email. So if I forget something or if you have some questions, you can check there. Um, Also, uh, on the back of your bulletin is a list of grocery stores that will pre-pack the food bags for you. (coughs) So that's another option. Um, This drive is through November 15th. Uh, That gives you two more Sundays to bring the bags in. Um, And... November 15th is also the last day to bring in your Christmas child, Operation Christmas Child shoe box that you can put in the lobby. The second announcement is to do with Christmas flowers. This year, the florist has told us that we need to get the orders in for the Christmas flowers early. Uh, They're going to be red poinsettias, as in the past, but we need to have um, everyone's order and money in by November 17th. That's a Tuesday. Um, I couldn't find any order sheets, but I was, uh, the the email that went out said that you can call the office, you can email the office, you can bring your money in, you can put it in the offering plate, Uh, you just need to, to... you know, note on there how many you want. Um, There was a specific request that if you wanted to have purchased any flowers in memory or in honor of someone to note that. And also (coughs) to note if you do not want to pick up your poinsettia after Christmas, uh, we will give that to shut-ins. And that's by November 17th. Oh, and and it's their $8.50 a piece and that's check only. Okay, (laughs) one more thing. Um, There was an error in the newsletter regarding uh, the prayer time for this evening, tonight. Uh, Prayers for our election day events and results. That's an online prayer that you can call into or else you can just pray at that time. It it was noted it was 8 to 9, but the real time is from 6 to 7 p.m. So if you're interested in participating in that prayer event. It's from 6 to 7 p.m. tonight. I think I got everything. (laughs) Okay, there's one more announcement, and that's from Jeff Ostkamp. Awesome. Okay, so I actually am going to sneak two announcements in here. Hopefully that's okay. Um, The first one is uh, men's breakfast next Saturday, which is the 7th of November. It is, again, bring your own breakfast, and weather permitting, um, subject to the judgment of an unofficial select few who show up early enough to decide, um, we'll be outside by the fire, or if it's too cold or rainy, we may be um, in the fellowship hall, I think, so. Um, Second announcement, oh, sorry, the other thing on that uh, is that the speaker will be um, uh, Rick Bernstein, who's the founder of First Fruits Farms, and many of us were up there this past week and met 
um, the people up there and saw the operation in action. I'm really excited to hear from him uh, sharing with us at the breakfast uh, on Saturday. So 7.30 a.m. and the announcement uh, I think went out this past week. So you can look that up in your email if you need to check the details. Okay, so the other item is uh, maybe a month ago, I'm not sure when exactly, I stood up and I announced the JARS missions trip for next summer. That's J-A-A-R-S, it's Jungle Aviation and Radio Service. It's an organization that was founded decades and decades ago um, to assist with Bible translation and other missions work by providing technical support at the time, mainly radios and airplanes for transportation and communication to assist with missions groups and Bible translations. And now they do a whole variety of other things as well. Um, we're going to do a, we're calling it a missions trip. It is a missions trip, but we're going to their headquarters to help them, the missionaries, uh, with various projects around their uh, site. Once we have our team put together, we'll talk with them about what our skills are and what their needs are and figure out what our projects will be. It could be anything from um, construction type stuff, landscaping to office filing work. To, uh, there's a, all kinds of things that they could use help with and we'll see what our skill sets are and how they line up with their needs. But my announcement right now is two things. One is that the that missions trip will be the week of June 27th to July 3rd next summer. And if you want to know more, you can talk to me anytime, but we're having an informational meeting next Sunday after church. Um, it will be as quick as we can make it while still communicating the necessary details, hopefully less than 30 minutes. Um, and we'll be discussing the trip. We'll not be do planning in great detail. It's more about communicating uh, to you all, anyone who's interested, um, to learn more about it and to help you decide if you'd be able to or interested in, in joining with the trip. Um, so weather permitting, we'll be outside in the tent. Otherwise, we'll um, probably be in the multi-purpose room for that meeting uh, next Sunday, November 8th after church. So thank you. Thank you all. And as we have prepared our hearts to worship and heard about opportunities for the work of the church, we now come and draw our hearts near to God who draws near to us. So hear this call to worship from John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes, believes in me shall never thirst. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence this morning, hear us. Hear us as we hunger for you and feed us with the bread of life. Hear us as we are thirsty in this dry and weary land and earnestly seek to be filled by you with streams of living water. Lord, we acknowledge that we have tasted at the table of the world, that we have eaten uh, what the world tells us will fill us, whether it's entertainment or, or money or security or uh, politics or, or education or our careers, uh, whatever it may be, Lord, we acknowledge this morning that we have tried those things and found them wanting. The deepest hunger, the greatest thirst we have cannot be satisfied with these temporal things, for we were made for a relationship with you, the one true living and eternal God, and there is a hunger and thirst within us that cannot be satisfied except in Christ. So show us Christ. Show us Jesus. May we meet with him this morning as we come into your presence. Help us to see clearly both our need and your supply. Help us to understand how you love us and draw near to us and draw us near to you. And Lord, even though we may not be able to explain it exactly in words, may we experience your love, your grace, your blessing today in such measure 
that as we go from this place, it overflows and blesses the lives of others so that you would help us to feed the hungry of the world as well. Father, thank you for meeting us and, and thank you for the blessing of worship and thank you for the blessings of, of, of all that you give us. May we truly rejoice and be glad in it. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Let's offer a sacrifice of praise as we sing to the living God now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, our first praise song is found in your bulletin inserts. It's titled Living Hope. It's our, our new song that we produced last week. Let's all sing to God together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, alleluia. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, alleluia. Praise the one who set me free, alleluia. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope.
Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. Our next song is In Christ Alone. Let's sing together. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless bay. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, and bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, God with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. And amen.
let's remain standing and confess our faith together using the Heidelberg Catechism in three questions. Uh, tonight, we are calling God's people, our congregation, to pray. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And as we all are aware, on Tuesday, the election will wrap up, even though many have voted early. So we're asking people to pray for that as well. Question 116 gives us an answer to a very important question. So let's confess this together. Why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking him for them. How does God want us to pray so that he will listen to us? First, we must pray from the heart to no other than the one true God who has revealed himself in his word, asking for everything he has commanded us to ask for. Second, we must acknowledge our need and misery, hiding nothing, and humble ourselves in his majestic presence. Third, we must rest on this unshakable foundation. Even though we do not deserve it, God will surely listen to our prayer because of Christ our Lord. That is what he promised us in his word. And then finally, what did God command us to pray for? everything we need, spiritually and physically, as embraced in the prayer Christ our Lord himself taught us. Amen. Please be seated. Before the time of uh, corporate prayer, we have a special video about the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So I'd ask you to turn your attention to that. That's <laughs> My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country, the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country and we lived as neighbors as I walked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamists and Pakas. Guns started firing we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed, were driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to pull on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues.
Oh, Lord, we come today with a fresh realization of how our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world face a level of persecution that we can hardly imagine. To be driven from your home, to be living with your children, with whatever you could flee with in makeshift shelters now for years. Oh, Father, please help us not forget Help us to understand that there are many believers around the world who face this kind of persecution regularly. In other parts of the world, pastors and Christian leaders and Christians are tortured and imprisoned, and we have life so comfortable here. We may, we may think to ourselves that life here will go on like this, Forever, it's what we've known. It's we've not known anything else for lifetimes upon lifetimes. But Lord, there's no guarantee. We don't have a guarantee for tomorrow. And, and so we pray that you would make us wise. We pray that you would help us to look at what we do have and to use it wisely. We pray, Father, that we would be willing to voluntarily give up some of the comforts, the creature comforts that we enjoy, that brothers and sisters around the world might have the necessities of life, that they might be able to have some water to drink or make their food in or wash their clothes, that they might have a shelter that keeps out the rain, that they might be able to ha have the means of cooking their food. Oh, Father, please, we pray that even today that you would make us want to sacrifice an hour of our time and join others around the world on our knees to pray for the persecuted church. And Father, we're so thankful for their testimony when we do hear it, a testimony that we seem to know not that much about, about loving our enemies and forgiving those who persecute us. This fellowship of suffering uh, we don't have in our American situation. But Lord, we pray that as we face whatever level of persecution we may face for standing firm on the truths of Scripture and seeking to maintain a faithful witness to all around of the gospel of Jesus Christ, please teach us. Teach us from the lives and testimonies of our brothers and sisters who have endured these things and been found faithful, who have overcome these things and rejoiced even in the midst of their of their persecution. Lord, this is an area that we must learn. So help us to want to learn. Help us to enter into this kind of fellowship with you and with them in some way. So Father, today as we gather in this warm, comfortable, safe facility, or in the comfort of our own home through the technology that you have allowed us to have, we pray, please, that you would remind us that this world is not our home, that you would remind us that our hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that though we may die, yet we will live. Lord, today is All Saints Day in the church calendar. It follows right after All Hallowed Eve. And so many in our culture celebrated Halloween, but how many will celebrate in sacrifice, silence, All Saints Day, remembering brothers and sisters whose lives have been lost because of their testimony for Jesus Christ, remembering those who have faithfully endured much tribulation for the sake of Christ, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember, that you would help us to acknowledge that we are part of a church that stretches far beyond what we can see. And by your grace, people from every tribe and tongue and language are right now singing your praises in heaven. 
So may our hearts be there too. May our desire be to join them before your throne of grace. And may we take every opportunity to join them on our knees before we see you face to face. Father, thank you. Thank you for the, the ministry of, of Open Doors and Voice of the Martyrs and Christian Freedom, these organizations that help relay information and, uh, that we may not have otherwise. Uh, we, we ask, please, that as we raise our children, we would raise them to, uh, to realize that, that life isn't just about more candy or more toys, uh, but it's about life and, and death and and there are oftentimes struggles that we do pray you would protect them from, but we also pray that you would help us to prepare them for. And so, Father, today as we are here in this place, knit our hearts together by your grace that we with one voice might pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, for those who minister to them, as well as pray for those who are persecuting them. We pray that the gospel would shine brightly in the midst, in the face of persecution. We pray that their love and forgiveness, even for their enemies, would be a lasting testimony. We pray that you would help us to understand how we might support them, not only in prayer but in other ways. And even, Lord, how we might bring uh, joy to their hearts by communicating our stand with them. And so, Father, as we come with one heart's desire to praise your name, whether in persecution or in peace, so, Lord, we come now with one voice to pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand once more and sing together hymn 146, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Please.
seated. As we come to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings, again, I would remind you that we have an opportunity for online giving, or you can mail in your giving, but this is a time of worship, so whether or not you give online or through the mail, give with a prayer in your heart. Uh, give acknowledging that we do so to support the Lord's work here and around the world. And so we pray that God would bless those tithes and offerings. Let us do that now. O oh, Father above, you give us bread to eat. We pray for our daily bread and you provide. And we here in this country often have more than we need, often have leftovers that are thrown away, often have extra that we may not even know what to do with. Oh, Father, please, as we bring to you our tithes and our offerings, may we understand that all that we have is from you above and that our greatest need is for you so that these material, temporary things that spoil and go to waste, that we can graciously and sacrificially even give these things away and not lose the best thing. And so please, as we give to you these tithes and offerings, fill us with yourself that all of this we might hold loosely in this world, that we might be very happy to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves cannot break in and steal. So please bless those who give and, and bless the gifts that are given for your sake and for the blessing of others in the name of Christ. We're thankful, O oh Lord, that you allow us to give not only financially and not only through our prayers, but also through our service. And so we do at this time also remember and pray for First Fruits Farm, which gives to feed the hungry. And we ask, Father, for your blessing upon them and thank you for the opportunity we had to serve alongside of them and ask, please, that you would show us other opportunities to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit those in prison or who are sick, all in the name of Christ all for your glory and for their good. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please do take opportunity uh, as you think of it to look at the other mission organizations and opportunities that we support as you consider the ACTC Thanksgiving offering and the Operation Christmas Child shoebox and everything else that might come before you. Let's stand once more and give thanks for what God has given to us using this offertory response, we give thee but thine own. Please stand once more. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus chapter 25. We'll be looking at verses 23 through 30 today. It's a wonderful uh, illustration of how God gives us detailed pictures of His goodness and grace uh, in the Old Testament uh, through the tabernacle. So let's hear God's Word read and recognize that it has been uh, not just decreed but done uh, in Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 to 16, we see uh, the construction of this particular piece of furniture exactly as God wanted it. Verses 23 through 30 of Exodus chapter 25, God relates to Moses, you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it, and you shall make a rim around it a handbreadth wide and a molding of gold around the rim. 
And you shall make for it four rings of gold and fasten the rings to the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame, the rings shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense and its flagons and bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly. Amen. Let's bow before the Lord and give thanks for his word, the bread of life, as we come into his presence, acknowledging that he speaks to us and meets with us. Father, thank you for this gracious invitation to come into your presence today. We are so glad to be able to partake of the bread of life, of the living bread of Jesus Christ, and to hear your word read. And we pray, O oh Father, that we would receive it eagerly as those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We pray, please, that you would help us to feed on Christ, to know the wonderful gift of your salvation, of who he is and what he has done for us. And we pray that we would see the glories and beauties and benefits of your salvation here in our text this morning. We pray further, Lord, that having been filled by you as beggars who needed bread and have found it freely provided for us, that you would help us to go from here and point others to Jesus Christ as the food for their souls too. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come uh, to this uh, continuing series in the tabernacle, the building of the tabernacle, I want us to remember what the primary purpose of this tent is. God gives specific detailed instructions to Moses in, verse, in chapters 25 to 31, numerous chapters, and then those those details are repeated in chapters 35 through 40 with the implementation or construction according to the plan of God. What's the primary message? Why does God spend so much time with Moses telling him what this temple, this tabernacle should look like, and then so much time relaying to God's people that it had been built just as God wanted it to be built? The primary purpose of the tabernacle was a dwelling place of God. It is God's house. Now, there in the wilderness, they had this literal tent where God has pitched his tent in the midst of his people. He says, well, you're, in, you're on the move. I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to move with you. When, when, when you pack up your tents, the Levites, that tribe is going to pack up my tent, and I'm going to go. In fact, I'll lead the way. But it's not only a dwelling place of God, it's also a meeting place for God's people. It's, it's the place where God's people meet him. It's like God inviting them into his house. And so what, what do we learn? Well, we learn here in this passage that, that God wants fellowship with us. We saw last week that God provides the way for us to come into his presence through the sacrifice, through the mercy seat, he dwells in his glory, enthroned above the cherubim. But that's a different picture than God inviting us to sit at his banqueting table. And that's what we see here. It's hard for us, if we recognize our own sinfulness and God's holiness, to dare to imagine that we would be invited into this close communion with him. You mean, I can sit at your table, Lord? Now, Americans or Westerners perhaps, but Americans maybe especially, do not have the same sense of hospitality that most other places in the world have and share. And it's to our loss. When, when we uh, were invited into a friend's home, the, the feast that was spread before us, they were from the Middle East, and, and it was an amazing display of hospitality and grace for us, their guests. But when we have people over, more often than not, we're like, well, there's the plates, there's the silverware, make yourself at home. And, and in a sense, that's a wonderful thing. We're, we're treating them like part of the family, but they certainly don't have the feeling of being an honored guest. 
But when God's people meet with him, we will see that they are treated as honored guests invited to the king's table. It's an incredible, incredible picture of the benefit of our salvation. So let's look here at the first few verses. Uh, But before we do that, I want us to recognize that as we spoke of before, the Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. The, The table for the bread is in the holy place not the most holy place. So there was a, a, a three-tiered, as it were, structure to the tabernacle. You had the outer court where people could come in and offer their sacrifices, where the, the labor was for the cleansing and so on. And then you had the holy place, and this is the first piece of furniture uh, that's described in the holy place. Only the priests could enter the holy place, and only the high priest one time a year could enter the most holy place. And again, recognize that there are they, these, uh, these sections with the restrictions are for the protection of God's people. They're protective boundaries. They're like the guardrails on a mountain highway. They're there for our good, not, not so that we can't have more fun, right? But, but these boundaries are because God is a most holy God, and sinners cannot come into his presence without being in danger of being consumed. God has made a way into his presence, but in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant here, it was restricted to the high priest once a year with the blood of the sacrifice. We have a better covenant, as Hebrews tells us. Christ himself invites us into the very heavenly places. So God starts from the inside and works his way out, and we come now to the table for the bread of presence. Verses 23 to 25, we see the instructions, and first of all, uh, Moses is given the materials. And you'll notice some similarities, if you were with us last week, with the materials that the Ark of the Covenant was constructed with and the materials at the table of the bread uh, for the bread of presence is constructed with. You shall make a table of acacia wood. Again, this was a wood that was readily available in the Sinai wilderness. It was a a wood that could be worked with and shaped, and it was also a wood that resisted rot and and corruption and so on. So it's it's a good, sturdy material and readily available. And so the table of the bread for the bread of presence is to be made from this acacia wood. And then the dimensions, again, a cubit is between 18 and 21 inches long. So this is uh, smaller actually than our communion table, uh, the bread, uh, the table for the bread of presence. A cubit, two cubits its length, a cubit its breadth, a cubit and a half its height. Uh, It's a rectangular shape and it's a little lower than a normal table that we would have. But then look at verse 24. We can see that this also is similar with the Ark of the Covenant, and it makes it distinct from the tables that the Israelites would have had in their tents, if they even had tables. And so, you shall overlay it with pure gold. Now, we didn't talk too much about it last time, but pure gold is a not just regular gold, right? It's been refined. All the impurities have been taken out. And so in the most holy place, we see that there is pure gold. In the holy place, again, the table for the bread of presence is overlaid with pure gold. And so we see this picture of the beauty, the majesty, and the holiness of God even in the materials that are being used. The Israelites would recognize that this is an awesome thing. This isn't just typical. It's not like God is saying, well, just, you know, put a a picnic cloth out wherever. No, he he has specific uh, honor that is due to him uh, because of his worth. His worth is amazing. Uh, we, you shall overlay it with pure gold, make a molding of gold around it, a rim about, around it a hand breadth wide, about four inches wide. And uh, scholars and even archaeologists are, are not sure uh, exactly how this looked. So there are some that say it was at an angle, which actually would increase the capacity uh, of the table to hold things. Uh, others say it was uh, perpendicular uh, there uh, so that it would hold things uh, in place. And that's certainly important because one of the things that we don't see here in Exodus 25, but we do see in Numbers chapter 4, is that the bread that was supposed to be put on the table 
was on the table when the table was moved. And so the table was wrapped in certain special coverings when the Israelites were on the move and the bread remained on the table. And so in some way or other, this rim helped hold uh, those things in place as well as the covering. And so we see that the materials are, are similar in many ways and there's some dissimilarity. For instance, the, the rings will be removed as we'll see in just a moment. But we have to ask why this is important or is this important? Maybe that's a better question. Not why, but is. Is this important? We, we really don't want to read into Scripture more than is in there. Well, we don't want to take our imagination and put it uh, upon what God has not plainly said. But we do certainly see from its very construction and its similarities with the Ark of the Covenant and the magnificence of the temple that Solomon built, that the glory of God is indeed reflected through this artistry, through the wise and good use of the materials that God has given, making something beautiful. And so that's legitimate to recognize that God is saying to his people, I am worthy of your best. I'm worthy of your best. Now, uh, you, you might remember, and I, I can't say it in church, uh, what, uh, but you parents can tell your kids what the acronym KISS means. Keep it simple. Uh, and I won't say that last word. Not in church. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily hold true of what we offer God. Does it? I mean, isn't there a sense that God is worthy of our best? Not, not the leftovers, not whatever we have at hand, but the best of what we've been given. Given with the best talent that we have. Uh, if, we, if we were to take time today, which I'm not sure we have time to do, but to look at Exodus 37, in fact, beginning in, in chapter 35, God blessed these craftsmen. There were artisans of the highest caliber who were called to oversee the construction of God's tabernacle. And, and I think it's instructive. I think there are things for us to learn that when we enter the presence of God, we, we really do need to not treat it as if it's just a trip to the supermarket. We need to understand into whose presence we come. That doesn't mean that we wear Armani suits. It doesn't mean that we seek to be flashy in, so that other people will see but it does mean that our hearts have been refined and purified in preparation to come before God. So the question is, do we hold God's presence with us as not only a tremendous truth, but as a high privilege? Do we understand that every time we gather in, in God's presence as a congregation, we are, we are before the one true living God, and what a tremendous privilege it is. Do we understand further that in the new covenant we have the promise that God is always with us, even as was illustrated in the building of the tabernacle, because where the people went, God went. In fact, he led them, so he was always with them. The table also, we need to ask ourselves about the table. And, and a table is made to eat on. Uh, now, uh, my, uh, if, you've, if you've been uh, at our house, you'll know that my end of the table is, is made to lay papers on when I come home. And I'm always being asked, well, when are you going to move your stuff? Because we need to eat at the table. But God's table is to fellowship with. God's table is to eat at. God prepares a feast, right? Isn't that Psalm 23? In the presence of my enemies. You have prepared a table. 
in the presence of my enemies. How much should that mean to us on the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church? We, we need to think about these things. We need to connect the dots. Well, let's quickly move to, to the accoutrements uh, for the table, verses 26 to 29. We see that there are rings uh, made, four of them, and they're golden rings. And we see also two staves or poles made of acacia wood and uh, overlaid uh, with gold themselves. This was to carry the table. Uh, the Levites uh, had charge of this responsibility, and they were given um, this task of carrying uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of Presence, and all the other furniture in God's house. But it is important to recognize that this is like God's house. And yet God was willing to move with them until they reached the promised land. And then a permanent temple was built by Solomon. And, and even better, now Jesus is the temple, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But again, just look here at these other things. And, and you shall make it plates and dishes for incense. It's flagons and bowls with which to pour drink offerings. And you shall make them of pour, pure gold. Uh, these are, are just utensils, but they are of uncommon worth because they're in the house of God and for God's, uh, in, to be in God's presence and for God's people. And so we see uh, that this is indeed the table of a king. If you were to look at the uh, meals of the Old Testament, one of the ones that might stick out to you is found in the life of David after King Saul had, had died, King Saul who had tried to kill David, who was God's anointed next king, uh, David asked, Is there, are there any relatives of King Saul left? And there was one. Do you remember his name? It's a very interesting name. Uh, you kids are going to have to ask your mom how to, or dad how to, how to spell it. Mel, uh, Mel, uh, I was going to say Melchizedek. That's not right, kids. Don't listen to me. Uh, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. And, and he was lame. He couldn't walk. But David invited him, not just invited him, wanted him, to come to his table and eat. What an honor to come to the table of the king. This is the picture we get of the precious fellowship that we have with God. Well, for the bread of the presence in verse 30, that's all we get in Exodus 25, a single verse. So I'd ask you to turn, please, in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 24. Just a couple of verses that I want to uh, give you to help us understand this bread of the presence. In Leviticus 24, uh, other details of uh, the temple service or tabernacle service are given, and in verses 5 through 9, we see more information about this bread. Uh, it's written, you shall take fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it, two tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf. That's, that's a lot of flour, fine flour. You shall set them in two piles or perhaps two rows, six in a pile on the table of pure gold before the Lord. And you shall put, in, uh, put pure frankincense on each pile that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion as a food offering to the Lord. The incense symbolizing uh, the prayers of God's people, the prayers of the saints. Now, let's just pause there for a minute and talk about these 12 loaves. The bread of the presence. Why is it called that? Because it's in the presence of God. It's right outside the most holy place, right outside of the footstool of the throne of God. And so this, this bread that's laid on the table is in the presence of God. And, and it symbolizes not that God needed food, he doesn't, but that we are to come and be presented before him and recognize that he provides for our needs. So there's a dual recognition, the recognition that we're dependent on God for the stuff of life. Bread is a common uh, picture of the staple that we have of life, what is needed to live. And so we recognize that it is from God that we have life but then we also recognize that it is for God that we live. It's from God we have life, but it's for God that we live, and we live in his presence. The 12 loaves seem very clearly to symbolize the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel that were a fulfillment of God's covenant promise to Abraham. 
And, and so it's a beautiful picture of God's redemption, his love, his grace, his provision for God's people. But let's go on. Every Sabbath, verse 8 of Leviticus chapter 24, every Sabbath day Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a most holy place since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. So each and every Sabbath, weekly, new bread had been baked the day before and was brought in and set on the, on the table of the bread of presence. Every weekday, what a rhythm, right? What a rhythm. Now, obviously, this uh, tells us, first of all, that this isn't food for God. Pagan practice was to put food before the, the, the idol daily. In fact, if you were to travel to Thailand, you would see outside of people's homes what they call spirit houses. And on these spirit houses, which were elevated little altars, there was not only burning incense, but were offerings of flowers and food because they believe that the spirits and the gods need to be fed. And if they were going to get food from the gods, they needed to feed the gods. This is not that. S Psalm 50, God asks, do I need food? And he answers, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything is mine. I don't need anything. From you, Acts 17, 25, Paul says something similar. All that we have is from God. He doesn't depend upon us, but we do depend upon him. And so we are taught to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And here we see that every Sabbath, every week, Aaron, the priests, came in. They brought the bread as a, as a memorial offering that all that we have is from God. They ate the bread in fellowship with God in that holy place as a gift from God, and then they served the Lord in the strength that God gave. Now, do we comprehend how dependent we are upon God's providential care? I, I, I don't know if, if I went around whether any of us in our congregation wouldn't have food enough already in their kitchens for the week ahead. Perhaps some of you have food enough for the month ahead. We have freezers and refrigerators and pantry shelves that are full. We have money in the banks so that when we go to the grocery store, we're not thinking necessarily, or most of us, what are we, what are we gonna get? We get what we want. Now, if, with all of that blessing of God, and it is a blessing that not everyone enjoys, with all that blessing, how easy is it for us to forget that we depend upon God? That when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, that needs to be a prayer that we mean from our hearts. We recognize that apart from God's blessing, apart from his providential care, even the bread we have would spoil in our stomachs, wouldn't strengthen us. So, we need to wrestle with that reality and, and how we acknowledge that reality. And, and then we need to uh, ask ourselves, during the times of plenty, do we testify to God's goodness and give him thanks? Because this memorial offering is a thank offering before God. Remember, they were in the wilderness and every day, except the Sabbath, God provided manna from heaven, manna from uh, a miraculous redemptive food for them to eat. And so this was a, a picture of their thankfulness to God for his goodness to them. And the, but the other part of that question is when times of want come, if there does come a season in our lives when we do not have what we think we need or certainly don't have what we want, will we continue to trust God? Will we continue to ask? Will we continue to wait for him? to provide what we need, knowing that the thing that we need most is a relationship with him. And that's what we need to see in Exodus 25, that in this piece of furniture, this table for the bread of presence, God is picturing a fellowship that we can have with him. That the relationship that we need most, the thing that we need most, the thing we were created for is met by God, with God. 
And this is why Jesus says in John 6, I, the true bread uh, comes down from heaven. I am the bread of life. Do we understand how much we need this bread of life? Or do we try to do life in our own strength for our own glory and for our own good? Michael, or Mitchell Kim and, and G.K. Beale, in their wonderful book, God Dwells Among Us, they write this, only by the presence of Jesus with us and the power of his word in us can we accomplish his work through our lives. Let me read that again in case you want to write it down. Only by the presence of Jesus with us and the power of his word in us can we accomplish his work through our lives. And where do we find that? We find it here. The bread, we find it here. The ordinary means of grace. God's word is found by his grace, in his word through prayer, in the sacraments, and in the service of God. We see in Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 to 16, that the blueprint is followed exactly. But we need to see more than that because we live in the new covenant. We live in the times when Christ, the promised Messiah that is pictured here in this piece of furniture has come. So do you see how Jesus invites you to feast in the Father's house? I had the privilege of officiating at Patty Ludwig's funeral yesterday. It was an amazing uh, time to, to gather and remember her life, but also look to her Savior. And the text that the family chose to be preached on at her funeral was John 14. That beginning verses, do you remember them? Where Jesus is speaking to his disciples before he dies. And they're troubled, and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, believe also, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions, as most of us know it. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come back so that we may be together. Right? Isn't that what we need? Isn't that what we want, to be with the Lord? And in the Father's house where there is room for any, room for all, the 12 loaves of the 12 tribes were before the Lord continuously. Not one was left out. It wasn't just the tribe of Levi, the Levites who had a loaf there. It wasn't just the tribe of Judah who got a loaf. And none of the loaves were bigger than the others. They were all made the same with fine flour and set before the Lord. There is room at the table of the Lord for you. Behold, Jesus says in, in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. And any who open the door and invite me in, I will eat with them. And at the Last Supper, Jesus says to his disciples, yeah, he's going and, and he's going to, to prepare for them a feast. What is that feast? Well, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it's called the marriage feast of the Lamb. Don't you want to be part of that feast? Don't you want to be at that banquet? Don't you want to enjoy the foretaste of it as God's word is read and preached as we celebrate communion uh, together regularly? Have you ever experienced the grace and love of God in these ways? If so, you will hunger and thirst for more. If not, please pray that God would give you a taste for his goodness. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you with our heads bowed, we are thankful that you are not dependent upon us for anything, but that you are pleased to receive our gifts, that you are pleased to meet with us as your people, and that you feed us with the bread from heaven. Thank you for Jesus Christ, and thank you that we can come and offer a sacrifice of praise, offer a, a thanksgiving, uh, praise, uh, an offering of thanksgiving, we know that, that you are glorified in this way. But we pray that, that it wouldn't just be in this place, which is a safe place to talk about you, but that we would so love you and, and know you and be so filled to overflowing with you and your love and your grace that we would glorify you with thanksgiving out in the world where it might be a little more dangerous. Please show us the way of salvation. Show us how we can point others to this way of salvation too. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand and sing our final hymn, number 598, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please stand and let Amen. Friend, do you know Jesus? Do you know the bread of life who came from heaven to satisfy your soul? And I'm not just asking you who are here in my physical presence. I'm asking everyone who is listening, no matter now or later, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, as the sustenance of your life, then talk to somebody who does and ask them, how can I feed on Christ? How can I have the bread of life that has come down to give us life? This last hymn that we sung is so important as we face this week, this month, the rest of this year. We are going through difficult times. It may feel to some that we are in a wilderness. Look to the Lord to guide us and to provide for us in life and in death. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you shalom, give you peace, give you wholeness in Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.